hard not to when it's, when it's your turn to, to speak or teach. It's hard not to have your mind kind of filtering everything through the passage you've been hanging out in. And uh, even as we wrap up that worship, I that verse, the last verse of the cornerstone. Don't you just wish there was like a quick button you could hit to get out of your struggle? Amen. Thank you for someone who's honest. <laughs> oh, how many times have I felt that? And I, I know that's true of us. My brother Byron is, is in pain every day. Oh, man, some day is coming when we can stand before a throne, not just be faultless of our sin, but be restored in our body. Some of you are going through major relationship issues. That, too, set right by Jesus. He's faithful. Some of us feel deep pains in our hearts, even this morning. And there will be a day when we stand before him, confident because of what Jesus has done, secure for us the life we were intended to have, perfect relationship with him, perfect fellowship with him. And the reality of that, uh, I don't know how Wayne chose his songs today, but the reality is that, is that even in our struggles, and that never once were we alone, that doesn't mean all along the way we did it perfectly, or we yielded perfectly to him, but all along the way he's, a, he's doing something, and he's at work in our process. And, uh, and so I just encourage you today, uh, as we come into the, this time of being in the Word, um, to let the Spirit of God have a hold of your heart, to grip, however you come in today, to grip uh, th with the truth that we're going to dig into from Galatians. If you are someone who likes to follow along, uh, feel free to turn open to Galatians uh, chapter 6. Um, today I am going to be hanging out there for a lot, so we're going to look at this a lot of different ways. So um, I don't have any PowerPoint, I don't have good notes for you uh, to take on the back of a piece of paper, but I'm confident uh, that there will be things that the Lord does. Thank you, Slade. Um, so I'm going to just pray as we start this. Jesus, as the leaders of our, of our, of our congregation stood up before us and, and humbly said, <laughs> um, we're inadequate. I, I feel that so often. I feel that as I look and I read and I have questions I can't answer and I wonder... How do I manage this text? How do I navigate? And, and then right there it is in the text, just the beauty that we, that we get to experience when we walk in step with you, Holy Spirit, that you will not fail us. You haven't before, you won't, ever. And so, even now, Holy Spirit, rest. It's your job to reveal truth. And so even as I speak, would you give me a check in my mind and in my heart if I'm about to say something that is a misrepresentation of your word. And, and for those listening and hearing and taking notes and reading today, God, uh, would there just be an enlightenment by your power and for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. So when, when a guy like me, a freelance preacher, I'm a youth pastor here, if you're visiting, um, youth director here, um, I, I often get to uh, the luxury of being able to go, and, and like two weeks ago, I, or three weeks ago, I preached at uh, Community Bible. Next week, I'll be at Centerpoint, and I get the opportunity to say, hey, God, whatever you've been putting on my heart, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in because I'm, I'm not qualified or adequate right now, but I'm, I'm confident you'll lead me and teach me. And, and this passage, Galatians 6, I mean, I think I, I first exhorted and challenged my adult leaders in the youth ministry, I think all the way back in September with this passage. Uh, if I can get a nod of approval from Wayne and Annette, okay, thank you. Uh, my memory's not failing me. Because there's something so beautiful about a passage that calls us uh, to bear each other's burdens. And, and, and we're not going to get to this section, but even that admits, don't grow weary in doing good. And, and so there's, there's this passage that's been on my heart for a long time. And as I chose it, my heart was simply to give an encouraging word that says, hey, brother, hey, sister, we get this exhortation from God to grab a burden of a brother and sister and to walk, and in doing so, it fulfills this love of Christ. And, and yet, as I found myself a few days ago immersed in the whole book of Galatians, I began to see the timing of our, of our God, that, that, that the context of where this is being written, and we'll get to the passage in a minute, it's so similar often to where we find ourselves, even here in this body, even for this time today. Um, so, a uh, quick amendment. I'm not going to get to verse 10. We're going to stop at verse 5. Uh, you've already tell the introduction has gone way, on, way too long. Uh, this is not going to go good if I've got 15 verses. So, we're just going to read starting in Galatians 5, uh, verse 25. 
And we're going to read through verse 5 of chapter 6. And this is going to help give us the, the context to speak out of. So it goes like this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him with a spirit of gentleness. And keep, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Now, um, if, if, if you've uh, been in the church for more than five days, uh, you've probably been in the Bible and thought, Micah, this is odd. They put chapter breaks in there for a reason. Why do you ruin this perfectly nicely parsed out, divided chapter line by making it messy and grabbing two verses from chapter 5? And, and I want to tell you why I did that. Because right there in that very first line of, of 25 is a lot of history. If you've not read this whole letter, he, is, he has just gone through. And he has just, he has just kind of pitted up against one another. This being yielded to this flesh, which does things for itself and selfish gain. Versus the spirit. And, and kind of coming under the influence as being believers filled with the spirit. And, and so there's this... This transitional setup that's happening, a buffer between the sections. Because he's about to go from the way in which this works theoretically, the way in which this is God's design, and in this buffer, he, he turns and, and starts chapter 6 with a very personal uh, challenge with this. And so what I, what I want to do is look at this section as well, include that in today's uh, today's text, because in the church of Galatia, so Paul is writing to encourage this church going through deep hardships. There's been a sad state of affairs, friends. There's been a church that had started with the true gospel of Jesus, believing in salvation through faith alone in Christ alone, and someone has come, and he uses the word, who has bewitched you? What happened? You started running so well. What happened? And, and the sad state of affairs is that is that someone has come into this church uh, with a, a false gospel of being justified not through faith in Jesus, but by yielding again to the Torah or the laws of Moses. So, so my standing before God is not by virtue of faith in Jesus who gives me the right standard standing. My faith is through this false gospel of works where this age-old text given to Moses by God, as I submit to that, I will then have a right standing. That's, 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 that's wrong. In light of what Jesus has done, this necessarily, to believe that, necessarily edges out and nullifies the true gospel of faith by grace for salvation. And he did this, it says in, in chapter 2, he, he, Paul tells us, how did he do it? Well, he became the curse for us. See, Christ redeemed us in 2.13 from the curse of the law. Because it says, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. And so in Christ, we can all, even Gentiles, have the promised spirit through faith. So the picture is that he's, he's bringing correction to a gospel problem. And now we're, we're moving into what that looks like. What does that mean? Because when we put our faith in Jesus, says Paul, what was true of Jesus becomes true of you and me. For just like he in his death was killed, we put our flesh, the sin, the damnation that comes with it, it dies also. And with his resurrected life, we too participate in a resurrected, a new life. And by virtue of that resurrection power, we can now live in obedience without just mustering it from our own effort. The famous passage in chapter 2 is, For uh, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. 
In the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, so this whole section on bearing each other's burdens, this is all, I'm going to get to that, but it's all couched in the context of what you do with the gospel. True gospel or false gospel will be shown in your life by how you handle life, yielding to the Spirit in the context of the congregation of believers. So, uh, he's writing these then as a buffer. So let's look at them. In, in, in verse 25, it says, If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that, that word if, it's a since. So, so since we live by the Spirit, we just read a couple passages that help us to see. Paul's already told us, the only way you live by the Spirit is if you are reborn. The only way you live by the Spirit is if you've trusted in Christ alone for your salvation. So, so if you are a believer in Christ, if you live by the Spirit, he then puts out kind of uh, the, the right path of action, the right, the right way that this will um, manifest in our lives uh, in, a, in, a, in an incorrect way, an expected way, and an unexpected way. What you should see and what you should not see. He says, let us, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Right off the bat, in this buffer, he's challenging the affections of our hearts. He, he's challenging the primary motives and purposes for which we act and live. And so let's examine conceit first. Let's not become conceited. Well, um, you wouldn't expect a spirit person to be conceited because you know that word conceit, you know what that means? It means to desire vain glory. So he, in transitioning, if, how can that be? How can I desire glory for myself if I put the flesh to death? Well, he, he explains it in two ways. See, either we'll participate in step with the spirit or in step with the flesh. And if we're in step with the flesh, it's going to give us this operation in the flesh where we rob God of his glory by seeking it for ourselves. He says there's two ways this is going to happen. In provoking one another or in envying one another. There's two ways that you're going to live with conceit in your heart, with the directive of self-glorification in your heart. And the two ways are provoking one another. That's the, 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 the image he's, he's creating is, is one of, of, of provoking or challenging. Uh, who, who challenges? you ever been like on a playground or in the weight room or uh, anywhere where competition is normal, you always find chatter mounts. You always find uh, one-upping people. See, to challenge is to, to move forward in life with a posture of pride, self-glorification. But what I see, interestingly, in the envying is often the opposite. Often, if I'm most passive or quiet or not gregarious, but kind of keeping to myself, I can still seek my glory. It won't look like trying to warn up somebody, but it will look like an invisible longing for their life, for their stuff, for their wife, for their career, for their position. I'll, I'll long for that. And, and it's a toxic heart bet on self-glory. So right off the bat, in this buffer, he's saying, if you live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be conceited. Let's not rob Jesus of his glory. So then what does it mean to keep in step with the Spirit? Um, if you have kids, uh, you know what I'm about to say is, is totally true, like I've been wanting to hear. Uh, grandparents the world over, ooh and awe, ah, any chance that little toddler, uh, grandchild of theirs, uh, is inching their way toward walking. As parents, however, we know that um, we can no longer take little Johnny outside of a little safe bubble. <laughs> unless it's been specifically child-proofed for the foreseeable future. For, for any and every object under the threshold of three feet will be broken and never to be put before the public eye again. We know that as innocent as it is for little, grandma, a little Johnny to be held in the hands of Grandma, who's keeping in step with little Johnny, that that little toddling turns into running, and that little running turns into destruction, right? <laughs> we know, we know that what was keeping in step to build is now running after just to keep up with. And so it is. And so it is when we try to keep up with the Spirit. 
So it is. What started um, in keeping step, we run after this, which implies something. In this passage of keeping in step, it implies some very critical things for us to understand. If I have to keep in step, it must imply movement. It must imply uh, intentional movements in a direction that we will want to and benefit from participating in. So the question we must ask ourselves is what is the spirit of God up to? What is he up to? You know, Jesus at the end of his ministry, especially in what's called the, the um, uh, it's, it's well, my mind's blanking out here, but it's in John 12 through 15. There's this section where in his parting time with his disciples, he tries to prepare them. He, he says, I'm going to leave, but I don't want to leave you as an orphan. I don't want you to leave you feeling lonely, left out, underinformed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the Spirit. In fact, you gave up everything to follow me, but it will be for your benefit that I leave you. He must be parting and leaving a very precious, comprehensively profound gift. And it's the Spirit of God. If you want, uh, if you're somebody who likes to follow, I'm going to go to John 15. Because here he spells out what this Spirit is doing. What does the Holy Spirit of God exist to do? In uh, chapter 15 of John, verse 26, <coughs> Jesus prepares his disciples by saying, When the Helper comes, whom I'll send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The next verse starts, and you also will bear witness. So the picture is that the Holy Spirit of God is going to come and enter the scene, and he's going to have a, a driving purpose, the glory of Jesus. Verse 13 of chapter 16 says, when he comes, the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into truth. Verse 14, he'll glorify me, said Jesus, for he'll take what's mine and give it to you. So the Spirit of God is at work and He's moving and, and in His movings, His primary motive is to give glory to Jesus. And, and when He does that, it's going to involve Him declaring uh, truth, opening the eyes of the unbeliever to see the truth. It's going to be empowering a, a, a lifestyle that is, that is wise. He's a counselor. And it's all going to be for the glory of Jesus. Earlier in chapter 16 it says he's also going to convict the world of sin. So the Spirit of God is up to something. And, and, and Paul's saying as we keep in step with him, all the things he's promised to do, you don't got to do. Isn't that good news? When you proclaim, you don't have to convict anybody of sin. That's Jesus' job. That's the Spirit of God's job. You don't have to change their heart. That's the Spirit of God's job. You, you, don't, you don't have to regenerate them, move them from death to life. That's, that's the Spirit of God's job. This is so beautiful. So that as I participate in Him, just like we saw in, if you would have read chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, as I keep in step with Him, He does all the eternal work, the eternally valuable work that I can participate in. He does all of it. My role is to walk in step, proclaiming Jesus. So, the believers are not to walk in the vanity of their flesh, conceited, robbing glory from Jesus. Instead, the believer is to walk with the Spirit, giving glory to Jesus as He reveals truth, convicts sin, and regenerates the unbeliever. That's good news. So now, in this text, finally getting to chapter 6, what you get is, instead of this language, I love this, because... And so often, uh, in, I think in Western Christianity, I'm guilty of this, I don't know if you are, but so often we can view our relationship with God kind of very uh, isolated. Like we're in this silo, and all I see at the top is an, a, a 10 foot diameter opening, and it's just me and Jesus, it's me and God. And, and yet that's not the picture that we get in, in, in the scriptures. Because the scriptures portray a family that has been unified, but then given individual responsibility within the family of God. So my actions individually aren't apart from the family. They're to benefit the family. And I'm to be the recipient of, of the benefit of this family. So Paul moves now and says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore in a uh, spirit of gentleness. 
So Paul issues a threefold charge. Act spiritual by restoring and bearing burdens. Watch for deception and test yourself. Paul's going to now in the next five verses do these three things twice. Act spiritual. Watch out for deception. Test yourself. You know, um, when I was uh, in college, uh, I thought I was invincible, like most people in their 20s now. Sometimes that creeps into the 30s. And uh, actually, and uh, just graduated college, by the way. I'm really proud of him. So uh, there it is. So it is. So this is for you. Okay. Uh, when I was your age, I got into my little Oldsmobile 88 from John Brown University and thought, I'm going to go home. School's done. Yay me. But then my friend said, hey, you want to come to a party and hang out? You know, we'll just eat some ice cream, watch a movie. And I'm like, sure, I can leave at 10 p.m. and go to Minnesota. No big deal. It's like 10 hours. And so about 8 in the morning, I'm passing through Worthington. I mean, I'm on the home stretch. Highway, stinking 60. And I wake up to see a ditch in front of me coming very rapidly, a big puddle just ahead of that, a nice culvert, concrete, I'm pretty sure. And as I'm coming in, I take quick action and think doing this would be a really bad idea. So I'm going to slowly ease my way out. And then the mud said, no, you're not. Woof. Suck me right into a puddle, up to, the, up to the doorstep. So as I open my door, the water is literally half an inch from the doorway. I'm fine. The car, I think, ended up being fine. But I got stuck. And thankfully, a man who was probably rebelling from the Lord dropped his wife at church and ran home. And, and on his way home, God sent him to deliver me. And uh, it was great. He, got, he took me to his farm. We got a chain. We hooked it on. And that frigid, snow-melted water, uh, it was good to get out of that. And uh, back on the road home in time for church. It was Sunday morning. So um, all that to say, uh, if anyone is caught in transgression, the spiritual is to restore them. I, I know that uh, you probably don't need a grammar lesson, but I find, I learned this in English class, I think, uh, that when you know what a word means, it helps you to understand, right? No one's going to say it. No teachers? Okay. If you know what a word means, that's the only way you can understand it. So I'm going to give you three definitions that are going to help us out to get this text. Caught means to be stuck, trapped, hung up on. Transgression, interesting word. It's a side slip. Unintentional error or willful action that is a fall, a fault, offense, or a sin. I'll get, I'll get to why this is relevant in a second. Restore, to repair, to restore and bring back to the original, complete, whole design. Okay, what does that mean? The picture Paul is painting for brothers and sisters in the body of Christ is that in my path, walking on truth, a time might come when I slip, I end up in a place where I'm a transgressor. I become caught, hung up, on, stuck in sin, bad doctrine, uh, error, woundedness. I become hung up and it, it prohibits me. Just like in my story of being stuck in my car, from getting to my designed destination, which is in step with the Spirit, doing the things of God. So, there's the picture. Someone's a transgressor and they are caught. You who are spiritual, restore. Wait a second. Doesn't it say you who are spiritual, label, judge? No, it doesn't say that. You who are spiritual, Spirit-filled. Spirit. So he just spent a whole chapter describing what spirit-filled meant. Uh, spiritual means. Spirit-filled. You who are spiritual, when you see your brother or your sister stuck and caught, you don't turn a blind eye. You don't, you don't harden a heart. Instead of labeling, there's empathy. And instead of uh, judgment, there's mercy. Instead of pulling away, there's a running toward and instead of wishing to be removed from their fellowship, there's a desire to restore them to fellowship, to complete design. And I love that word because it's not restore them to where they were. How many of you know if I fell and I get stuck, I probably fell from a place that wasn't also very good. So the picture isn't restoring them where they were before they got really stuck or someone saw it. The picture is restore them to God's design, the complete working of the body of Christ in love. He changes the picture then from restoring the transgressor. He changes it now to, in the next verse, to 
bear one another's burden and fulfill the law of Christ. That's 6, uh, verse 2. You know, uh, for those of you who don't know my story, I I'm not getting the whole thing today. We don't have time for that here. Uh, praise God. Uh, but, but I've come from some ma major brokenness. I, I uh, went to college and fell into a lot of different sins and struggles and got married. And two years into my marriage, found out my, year, my, my wife had uh, been having an affair for a year. And in the midst of that split, she moved to New York. I moved back home to Mountain Lake, and I was a broken mess. And I knew there was a stirring in me that I knew I needed to get right with Jesus. Time wasn't going to heal this. I needed to draw near to the healer. And, and yet, in that, it felt like an endless struggle. Um, and a man comes into my life, and actually it was a whole couple, Ken and Becky Kramer. And they began to do something that was so necessary and so unwarranted. They, they began to uh, bear my burden with me and demonstrate Christ. You know, Ken's this textbook encourager. You know, the one that would never flatter uh, but never runs out of positive words. <laughs> and uh, some people are nodding like, they know, they know Ken, you know what he's like. He'd look at me and he would genuinely say, man, Micah, you know what? You are doing so well. And I want to be like, what are you looking at? Are you kidding me? I'm trying to move out of uh, my parents' house. I'm trying to get back on my feet. I have no clue what I'm going to do with my life because my degrees in ministry, that ain't going to work. Turns out God had other plans. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I... I was in this spot where I felt hopelessly stuck, and I needed help. And God sent Ken to bear my burdens. And every time he bore that burden, if you've ever been stuck, you know that you can look at the problem so long, you wouldn't even notice if you were inching your way out. Because when my car started coming out of that ditch, you know what was right in front of it? More mud, more water, a culvert, reeds. Sometimes you can look at the problem, you can be so stuck, you forget to see, look from where that help comes. And every time Ken would bear my burden, it would lift my eyes to see that maybe, maybe, I would get out of this. So Paul changes this language from bearing the burden, and I missed this, but he said, do that with a spirit of gentleness. For the same reason he says bear the burden. Why? Because the process of being restored from rebellion and pain and a, and a false gospel, bad doctrine, it, it's a long process. It takes gentleness. It, it's, it's wrought with setbacks and hardships. And there's a need for gentleness because there's doubt, there's conflict, there's unbelief, there's disbelief. But this proves out that transitional statement to be true, that my end is not ultimately my glory. It's that of Jesus. And Jesus came to seek and save the lost, not make a public spectacle. So when we do that, we fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Pulling faces, it's okay. I love this, man. We fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus said, as, as he taught, he said that this is the law. It's not the law of Moses, as the Judaizers and Galatians were trying to, here's the law. You love God and you love others, you'll complete every jot and tittle of the volumes of works that are required to please God. If you love. In chapter 5, Paul already tells us what it is. He says, I love this word picture, chapter 5, verse 13, Paul tells them, You are called to freedom, brothers. So instead of using your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, through, use your freedom through, through love to serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. I love that language. Use the freedom of God to go into slavery to one another. Use the freedom of God to serve one another. It doesn't fit our paradigm. My freedom is what so I have to live in slavery, but not in the ways of, of God. We bear one another burdens because when we come alongside, it's this visible demonstration of the love of Christ. Because when you've been set free from the law that you could not possibly in a million years live up to, you've been set free from that to one single law, love. And when you love, you fulfill all of the Christ's expectations for you. Well, we got to get going here. The next section is a warning against deception. Keep watch lest you be tempted. 
If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he is deceived. Why does he, why does he say that? If he acts spiritual, he's charging people to act spiritual. And, and it's a tongue-in-cheek statement almost, like you who are spiritual. In other words, if you, if you say you're spiritual, let's see it. Let's see the love of Christ demonstrated. And then right behind it, he puts this warning in there to watch themselves. I am not convinced... His main concern is that as I reach down to help my stuck believer, I'm going to get stuck in his mess. The picture is, if I don't reach out, I will get stuck in the mess of my selfishness and pride. My arrogance, my conceitedness, my failure to yield to the Spirit. The stuck that I will get is not in their moral failure, but my religious failure. He says, uh, he, then, he then goes on to say, um, because when we bear their burden, we fulfill the law of Christ. To not bear their burden is to fail utterly at the law of Christ, which is love, which is present, which is present only when we're in step with the Spirit. He then says, it's so important that we not be deceived. I'm going to give you a test to make sure you're not deceived. In verses 4 and 5, he says, Let your test your own work so you'll see your reason to boast is in yourself alone and not in your neighbor. For each will bear his own load. That seems like a contradictory term, isn't it? Like bear his burden because you've got to carry your own load. <laughs> We've got some farmers in the area, and I, I thought of a, a maybe helpful analogy, and then maybe later you can tell me if, if, it, if it didn't hit. Uh, but sometimes we get this elevator, I think it's busy a lot, maybe making some nods for farmers. Uh, grain's coming in and out, but especially at harvest. A lot of grain coming in and out of this elevator. And, and, and Paul is painting a picture of bearing the load. And so I want you to get this. The first truck pulls in. He pulls into this weighing station and he's half, he's half full. See, he's putting his confidence in his neighbor, right? He pulls in and he's hoping at half full, the person in front of him was like quarter full. He knows he's better off than the guy with the flat or with the wheels that are stuck in the mud in the field still. He's on the scale and he's half full. And his confidence for a commendation from God, for, for the approval of God, his confidence is that he's half full in there, unlike the guy who was quarter full or didn't make it. That's not going to do you any good. Because you've got to give an account for your full load. So the, the picture he paints is, instead of a truck pulling into the scale at full capacity, sure, he left his fuel at half full, but wouldn't you know, on the way, he came across the guy with a flat tire, and he took his load and said, I'll get it to the elevator. He came across another truck at 125%. Farmers don't act like you don't overload. Okay, we're in church. <laughs> and, and he sees that this guy's at 125%, and he says, hey, throw that in. I'll, I'll take that load. He sits by the field where they're stuck, and he carries the load. And as he gets to the scale, he weighs in at 100% full capacity and receives the approval of God because he bore his load. Why? Because his load wasn't his load. His load was our load. And we live around this church like, if I just do me, I'm cool with God. Friends, you got to see, to not bear the load is to show up half full. It's to miss the blessing of God as he pours into us and as he calls us to pour into others. It's to miss the principle of though we are a family of God, we give individual account to our participation in the family of God. And how good it is when a brother pulls up next and takes my load for me. Because I wasn't going to get there without him. That's the picture that Paul paints of bearing the load. So now what do we do with it? All well and good, Mike, a good, good exegesis there. I think we get it. Now, what changes? What changes? Sometimes I find it helpful just to be awakened to the reality that if there's not going to be a change in me, there won't be a change in us. Because revival starts here. Because revival starts here. So, how do you think Paul wished the Galatian church to receive this. I think he wished that they would believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ and that their faith would be in him alone because Jesus was perfect, which is great. A, because I can't be, and, and, and B, because that perfection 
is a constant reminder of my failure when I try. So because I don't have to be perfect, I can trust Jesus. I believe the gospel, he was perfect, so I can't be. So I don't have to be. I believe that Jesus died a death that was mine. It was mine. My transgression, my being stuck, my sin needed to be paid for. And, and that sin was so real that it severed off contact from me and God. And I'm, I'm now outside of relationship with Him. But Jesus in His death pays the penalty to restore that. I need to believe that. I need to believe that just as He died, He did not stay there. He rose from the dead. A victor. He rose from the dead. And the, and the resurrection power that rose him from the dead is alive in me and it's alive in you when we believe in Christ because it now gives us victory over sin and death because we become inheritors of eternal life. Amen. And that's ours. And if we don't believe that, we can't do any of this. And then, of course, God's always true to his word. Jesus promised and then sent the Holy Spirit, to fill us, to keep in step with Him. And that's such good news. So He also, we believe in true gospel. I think He also wants the church to act spiritual by restoring the rebellion, the hurt, and the deceit in our midst. I think He wants us to act spiritual by bearing each other's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ, which is love. I believe He wants the Galatians to heed the warning not to be deceived, and because it's so likely that we're deceived, He wants us to test ourselves. Double check, check and double check that what comes out of me in action and thought and in deed is a reflection of the love that I've encountered in him. Test ourselves. Finally, I think we need to remember something. This word picture of bearing burdens is brilliant. Because in Matthew 11, Jesus, after declaring judgment on the cities that refuse to repent, he declares judgment over them, but then finds gratitude in the Father's will to reveal truth to the humble. In that setting, he says this, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find the rest that your souls need. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. So, who's caught in the cords of unforgiveness near you? Who's bound up by pervasive pride? Who's stuck in passions in this world? Trust the gospel. Walk full of the Spirit. Act spiritual. Heed the warnings. Test your load. And reproduce the heart and the works of Jesus who humbled himself demonstrated a servant-hearted, sinner-restoring, burden-bearing love and bring honor to Jesus. Jesus, your ways are so good. You're infinitely more gentle and kind than my unrepentant heart ever deserved. Those of us here who need that spirit of rebuke or awakening, I'm, I just delight that it's your, it's your job, Spirit, to do that now. And I pray in the name of Jesus for hearts that are humble and, and re resist the pride. Those of us who needed that encouragement to bear burdens from people we see, we keep wondering why they're stuck or stumbling. And I just pray in the name of Jesus for that spirit to lead us into a a posture of restoring with gentleness and restoring with a patience that allows us to go the full distance with Him. And Father God, I just I pray that we would not be deceived. That we would be people that are so <laughs> touched and immersed and changed by the truth and the love that is demonstrated in Jesus Christ that we have a hearty confidence in Him alone for our salvation. And then while we live in that freedom, serving you and serving our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. You just